Well, as I said, thank you all so much for being here. I'm, I'm Julian Rankin. I'm the director of the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. And we're here tonight to celebrate the opening of an exhibition called Bearing Witness um, Visual Elegies and um, Southern Vis Visual Elegies. And, and this is work that juxtaposes Walter Anderson's art with that of Jason Bolden. And we'll, we'll get into this in our conversation, but it's very interesting and poetic that you know, Walter Anderson was born in 1903, died in 1965, and, and Jason Bolden was born in 1965. So there is this passing of the mantle <laughs> that, um, that has happened. And, um, and again, this is an exhibition that examines and explores you know, death, remembrance, and rebirth uh, through Southern art and place. And I want to thank a, a few folks um, for making this possible, certainly the folks in the room for being here, and, and Jason and the artists and our curatorial team, um, but also the sponsors for, for making it possible. Our exhibition schedule is, is presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Mississippi and the Mississippi Arts Commission. And this particular exhibition was developed um, in partnership with the University of Mississippi Museum and uh, has support from the O'Keefe Family Foundation, um, their endowment for the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. And then um, a, a very critical piece of this is uh, funding through uh, the Mississippi Humanities Council, uh, which comes from the National Endowment for the Humanities, who are presenting the exhibition, uh, these programs, and more will be coming in the months to come, and also a catalog that will accompany this exhibition and will be coming out in a few months. Uh, so that being said, I did want to read a quote from Anderson, which you'll see in the work that both of these artists are, are talking about and thinking about and enacting some of the same themes. But Anderson did talk about in his Horn Island Logs about, you know, walking down the beach and, and finding a dead gallinule and saying the poor Harlequin had danced his last dance and I stopped to do honor to his remains. And, and really what we're talking about today is is not just death in nature and that, that this is a form of creation of nature morte of, of dead nature that has existed for thousands of years but so often in in this context in the 20th century and the 21st century a lot of things die and we pass them by and so i wanted to ask jason just to, to start a question about this this notion of personal experience but also the context that you're participating in so how, how did this body of work start? You're also a portrait artist and most people know you for that, but this is very private and personal work, but it's also um, engaging forms, still life, and, and also um, others that have been happening and artists have been using for many, many years. And you said to me that you and Anderson are, are sort of drinking from the same stream, so to speak. So how would you begin to talk about that? Well, um, all the works in the show are non-commissioned work. So I I make my living thing commission portraits, um, but um, I have a, I, I, that's my vocation. So then I have an avocation that's to paint on the, on the weekends and on the holidays when I have my time off. And so this is very uh, personal work to me. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not fulfilling a commission. I'm not fulfilling someone else's request for a painting. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it started, um, there were several moments when I guess I noticed that things that had died uh, were just as beautiful or, or, or allowed me to appreciate their beauty um, in death. Uh, a, a small little chickadee that I found on the side of the road um, back in 1991, 1992 um, was the, probably the first dead thing that I found. And I, it, I was just struck by the wonder of it all. Uh, the, the, this, the tragedy of, of finding this little chickadee, but I, I sort of wanted to celebrate it, just like the quote that Anderson uh, had. It was there on the side of the road, and, and cars were going by, and, and, and it was, I knew, I knew from living in a southern environment that maggots would be at it within, a, a, you know, a day, and, it, and nobody would remember it, and so I took it home in order to give it uh, a wake, to give it a, an elegy. Um, and I, I don't think I painted another dead thing for years after that, but that's sort of perhaps the genesis. And, and, and then I kept on noticing things, not just the dead animals, but the flowers and the branches. There was a painting in here of a branch that I just, I was walking across my driveway and I saw this branch and I thought, gosh, that is just such a beautiful form. And it, and it is, um, you know, as a, as a, a an ecclesiastical writer would say, you know, it's it's going to be gone. It's it's, it's dust in the wind. Well, 
but any it's just God <laughs> mixing my mixing my <laughs> my quotes here. But anyway, but it's it's um it's gonna be gone. But it was just such a beautiful form, and I just, just sort of wanted to uh, give it homage. And um, anyway, I guess that's it, drinking from the same stream. I mean, we talked about this when we first um, talked about the show. I, I told you I did not want to be compared to Walter Anderson. <laughs> I don't want that. That I admire him so much, and I knew I'd always come up short. But what I guess when we started talking about some of the parallels, I mean, this is this work is is not made for a for a, a, a market. It's not made for a commercial market. And Walter Anderson didn't do his for a commercial market. It was created in in privacy, um, in isolation, and and um, his was as well. And, and they center on this sort of idea of passing and a celebration also of the corporal body, the, the physical body, this, this tangible body that we have. Of course, w w when we inhabit our tangible bodies, we have a spirit that inha inhabits that. And at death, that spirit leaves, but the, the corporate, the vessel remains. And if we didn't have the vessel, we wouldn't have had the spirit. And so we sort of repulse at it. We repulse at this vessel as soon as the spirit is gone. But is that the right way to, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to give homage to, to, to that which held the spirit and, um, you know, helped it, helped it walk on this earth. I don't know. Gosh, yeah. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a good segue. I will say an Anderson anecdote that you um, you hit on, perhaps inadvertently, but you know when Anderson was on Horn Island, where he found many of these creatures, you know, dead pelicans and and birds, but also, of course, you know, trees and and a lot of the the animals that he actually lived with. He called them you know, his familiars, his, his basically his dinner guests. And so when these animals would die, he would paint them, yes, but he would also bury them, and he had a, a pet cemetery, Simmy's Hill, which was named after a, a dead duck that he, uh, he encountered out there. And he, he writes about burying a creature and thinking perhaps he had buried it too shallow. But then he remembered that, you know, well, he came back and, and the, the maggots, the, the worms, you know, they were feeding on this thing. So it was regenerating and rebirthing and supporting life um, through, through that. And you mentioned your father and your father, Marshall Bolden, you know, a, a renowned and esteemed portrait artist who you learn from and apprenticed with, but, you know, some of the works in here are also um, engaging that, the place you came from in the Delta. So I, I just had a question about memory. You know, we talked about the, the idea of doing, um, paying homage and, and drawing our attention to things that we might not ordinarily see, but how has creating this work and, and continuing to, to look on the world with these eyes helped you engage your own memories and certainly for example, the trees that might have been at your daddy's studio, and an example, for example, and I don't mean to go into a to another intimate uh, memory, perhaps, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is it is a uh, very poetic that, for example, the magnolia wreath that's in this exhibition that was the funeral wreath, but but also this idea that trees or you know even um, animals who might not live as long as trees, they all have memories. There's an echo that's left behind that the artist in this case is finding. I th I think I learned a. a uh, when I started, so painting portraits was sort of an arranged marriage because my dad painted portraits, if you like, and and I sort of went into the family business, you know, and um, I didn't fall in love with portrait painting until about ten years after I was actually painting, and I realized what portrait painting is about. Portrait painting is about creating memory, is uh, uh, is establishing memory. Um, in a visual terms. The visual terms are easy for us to understand. It's an introduction to the to remember who somebody was, what they did for us, whether it was through a family, how they participated in the family, or in a public institution, what this person brought to the institution during their tenure. So um, in that way, a, a, a painting, a, a painting of a, a for public institution is about corporate memory. Um, and, and, and what do we, how can we learn from that? How do we, how do we bring that down into, into the things that we do? And, and for a family and, and, and for corporate, corporate to have a, a, a cast of portraits around you, um, helps tell you who you are, 
helps give you an understanding of where you've come from and how you're to act. That's why we keep family scrapbooks. I mean, no, not everybody has portraits on the walls, but we all have scrapbooks. And those are pictures that tell us that um, this was Aunt Eddie, and this was uh, Aunt Willette, and this was my grandmother, and, and, they, and, and Aunt Willette taught me how to do this, and Lopo taught me how to do that. And, and I need to live up to these standards. They had certain standards. They tell us who we are and to whom we belong. And that's a very powerful thing. Now, if you can take that, I've, I've, been, I've been sort of washed in portraiture. Now, I discovered land, uh, still life and landscape painting sort of after I discovered, my daddy never liked still life painting. He liked landscape painting, never liked still life painting. But I sort of discovered those things on my own. But I was, I, I, I put on this portrait shirt when I did the landscapes of still lifes and I saw that that's memory making as well. And it's also approaching that landscape and that still life from the same individual uh, as I would with a portrait, as that as, as you would approach an individual. And so you're looking for universal things through an individual subject. And so um, uh, if it makes any sort of sense, painting a bird is painting a portrait of that bird and, and, and somehow commemorating it the same way I would commemorate a, a person. I'm giving evidence to them, I'm giving testimony, I'm offering um, as the show title suggests, I'm bearing witness to this thing that existed that maybe nobody else will remember. Um, and so it's a, I, I, don't, I don't know if they're, um, I don't know what to call the paintings. I don't th I call them meditations, I think is too highfalutin, but there's, there's something about them that is, uh, it, 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 there's just to bear evidence um, in um, so a painting I'm let you talk a <laughs> painting a painting is like a visual poem okay a, a painting is a really really short art form um, it's not a long thing it's not like a two volume work um, uh, and it doesn't and it doesn't have this great arc of a of a great um, uh, a, a work of fiction you know, with the rising action and the climax of the falling action, or anything like that. It's just a really short poem, and it's just a few words collected together. And 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 like a poem, um, sometimes meaning comes in between words within a poem. When you put two words up against each other, sometimes some stronger meaning comes out than the words individually would have without them. And I like to think that paintings can do the very same thing. That if, if, because a painting is taken in just like a poem is in one sitting, and then you, 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 it's, you don't have to come to it over time. It's an immediate reaction. Um, so, so these are all, I guess, poems on the wall. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess I would say that. And, and, and as, I, so there, there's this poet, Mary Oliver, um, and I, I really liked what she said one time in an interview process that she considers herself a reporter more than anything else. And that's sort of like, I want to consider myself too. Saying their poems is pretty highfalutin in itself, but I really just want to be a, a reporter and just reflect that which is there. I'm, I'm not a, when I paint, I, I'm, Walter Anderson could visualize something beyond. And, and I think most artists, and that's our conception of artists, is you visualize something beyond, something that's not there and you realize it and you bring it in. I, I, I just want to reflect what I came into contact with. Um, one time I, I was painting this portrait of a minister. And um, I, I have this, when I paint a portrait, I, I have an interview process and I try to find out what makes them tick, what, what, how, what makes them an individual. And, and we, were, we were chatting and, and I asked the minister, I said, so when you get up in the pulpit, what is it that you want to do to your congregation? What is it that you want to do? Uh, do you, I, gave him some, I gave him some options to us. You know, do you want to exhort them for money? Do you want to uh, challenge them to live better lives? Sounds like a museum director. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you, 
do you do you want to change them in some way? Do you want to do you want them to change to turn around, and come out of out of the room, change in some way? And he thought a bit, and he looked up. He was a very wise man. He looked up and he said, "I'm sorry, y'all." He said, "I want to bring them into the presence of God." He said, "That's it. What they do in the presence of God is their own business. It's my job to bring them there." And it just struck a chord with me, and that's, I had been doing landscapes and still lifes at that point, and that's exactly what I want to do. If y'all will allow it, when you go to one of the paintings, it's just hopefully bringing into the presence of what I came into the presence of. So a painting is, always has three parts, the love triangle, okay? <laughs> so there's the subject, right? And then there's this artist, and this artist is animated by the subject and paints this painting. And then a viewer comes along, and the viewer somehow is connected to the subject and the artist. But in the way I see it, the way I like to do it, I sort of want to get out of the way as much as I can, if I can, if I can. I want to get out of the way of the, of the artist, and I want the subject and the, the subject and the viewer to have that connection. For the subject to be in the presence, the present, the, the viewer to be in the subject of the presence. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a realist painter. It, because most people, they don't have to make any jumps. They, they, can, they can understand perspective and value changes and that kind of, oh, it looks like a blue jay. You know, they don't have to do that. But if I sneak in a little piece of orange paint or, uh, or, uh, or, or something like that, it, 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 it can help animate it and, and get them to the spot that I'll, I maybe want to be. But I can be sort of be out of the way. Yeah. Does that yeah. make any sort of sense? It does. And, and you talked about, um, you know, this reportage idea of coming upon things and and doing justice to them such in a journalistic way almost. And Anderson was certainly not only a realist painter. I mean, he was not necessarily that, but he did choose to depict subjects that you know, he was not a surrealist or completely abstract. I mean, that's why he's hard to define. But you think about his process, one, of creating work, and so much of his watercolors were done so quickly as a, a manner of realizing, which right. is the word he often used, this moment that he had had, this transcendent moment. But also just coming upon things almost like a beachcomber, which was another, you know, very astute observation from his family. You know, that, that was part of the reason he was such a genius is that he, he didn't walk past things that might have value. I um, mean, you, you talked about a, when, when painting one of these works, which is the rabbit, you've, you gave us a, a little bit of context of, about many of these. And you talked about and this really is you know, somewhat of a journalistic uh, approach. You, you actually recounted coming you know, in winter, you're traveling along a lonely stretch of Mississippi Highway and a rabbit darted in front of your car. Uh, the inevitable happened and you stopped to, to make sure that the rabbit didn't suffer. And you said all the stars in that enormous dark sky seemed to watch. As I grieved and wonder over this amazing creature, the rabbit still looked so very much alive. And um, and I wondered too that no, no pun intended that idea of wonder in in the midst of death is a very um, interesting one and one that I think we intuitively may know, but it's not something that we talk about a lot in normal life. A lot of times, death, especially when we see some gruesome roadside uh, roadkill, um, well, it's not something we want to dwell on. It's there. Yeah, I hope the paintings by, by having an artist, like somebody like Anderson, he does it for me, frame these things that are in death somehow allows us the, the opportunity to, to dwell on that moment rather than, if we see it in real life, we usually are repulsed by uh, an armadillo on the side of the road. Uh, we don't want to necessarily um, stop and, and, and think about, it, you know? Um, and, and it's dangerous. Um, and you can get leprosy from it, uh, you know, and um, and so by by isolating these things, um, I think that's I think that can be the power that can be the power of any art is that you 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 you, you put your lens on it, you, you you isolate it, and then you can you can contemplate that that thing for a little bit longer. Mm. Um, I think that might be the power. I tell I tell you though. One of the things that I, that I really admire about Walter Anderson that I, I just can't get at myself, um, and it's something my daddy would talk about. So when you're doing portraits, so go back to portraits. There are two types of likenesses that um, 
what a portraitist tries to get. There's this tangible likeness of Julian Rankin with a brown hair and a brown mustache, heavy glasses, brown eyes, um, a little bit of receding hairline, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> prominent chin, prominent chin. Whatever those physical attributes are, those are physical, tangible attributes that we can actually measure and we can actually scientifically sort of put down. But then there's the intangible likeness. <laughs> there's the intangible likeness of what is what is Julian like? What does he like to do in his free time? He's a museum director. What does he like to do in his free time? What is it? What are his musical tastes? Um, uh, how does he greet? Uh, does he like fried chicken? Or how? how, how what kind of? What, what's you know? Where's the best sausage biscuit in town according to Julian? All these things that are intangible about about Julian Rankin. So when you're painting a portrait, if you get the physical side right, if you get all the physical things right, but you miss something of the spirit of the person, then you don't have a portrait. You don't have quite the portrait. You have a hollow, you have a driver's license photograph. That's what a driver's license photograph is, is a portrait without a soul. That's why we always hate our driver's license photographs. <laughs> and then the cop who pulls you over doesn't care how you like your fried chicken or where you get your sausage biscuit. All they want to know is that you match up with the registration number. But on the other hand, if I go out and I paint a portrait um, of somebody who's very melancholy and I decide to make it just swirls of blue and, 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 and mauve and, and, and dark colors and maybe a little orange over in the corner for that fleeting dream that got away. And I say, this is a portrait of Malcolm. You know, uh, that didn't tell you what Malcolm looked like. That didn't tell you what he felt like, what his presence in the world was like. And so for me, that's a little disappointing as well. For me, it's a both-and situation where I want this intangible presence and I want this tangible presence. And when you get both of them together, you get something that sort of resonates. Mm -hmm. Now, Walter Anderson was a genius about that because what he was able to do through his investigation of marks and color use and composition and that immediacy you're talking about of painting and, 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 and uh, immediate, immediately with the, with the watercolors, keep, this impression of life, um, the marks that he makes around around the subject are just as important as the marks that he makes within the form itself. The composition on the paper, you all talk about in your in your in your current exhibition, the form that he takes that dictated by his, the composition of his paper help bring this. Not a, and so he pays he pays this wonderful balance, this wonderful attention to the to the spirit of the subject and to the into the physical nature of the subject without sacrificing either one of them. And man, I want to do that the same way. <laughs> but I think I err on the physical side of things because that's just the bow tie kind of guy that I am. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I, and I, I anyway. I, yeah, it's perfect. So I do want to ask if there's any questions. Um, I certainly have a few more, but we don't want to keep y'all too long. But are there any questions out there or re reflections that you want to bounce off? Jason or I? Yes. Why don't you sign your work? Why doesn't he sign his work is the question. And Anderson often didn't sign his. So maybe he's copying Anderson, Anderson again. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just don't think it's very important. I, I mean, I, have you ever seen the, the books that you see in airports that says, James Michener, the Lions, or whatever it is, where the person is more important than what's being you know, I do sign them on the back, I, or I usually at least make a notation of when they were done on the back. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't know. It's just it's just not that important, and I'm I'm forced to sometimes. And I and anyway. Yep. Yes, uh, Monsieur Madame, you have been following and inspired by Walter Anderson and other. You know, both of them, as one, both of them try to capture what they have in front of them in nature. Yes. You know, yet, both of them deal sometimes with death. You know, Walter Anderson made a beautiful drawing of the dead raccoon, which became his friend. So, there is a point into that, so the, the eulogy to the death of the friend of the raccoon. But Walter, I mean, by other one, he actually went the other way, yes. right? Because he actually sacrificed to be able to give the representation for us, the viewer, as you mentioned. 
So there are two different things in there, which are kind of you know tension between the two of them. And the second one is that you doing portraits. And have you done group portraits? And have you included himself in the portraits like Velasquez did? Uh, yes, so quickly, the, I, I have done one group family portrait and I based it on Las Vegas, um, uh, the famous Velasquez portrait, and, and I did put my reflection in there just like he did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I it up, and I hope nobody ever sees the portrait. But, um, That's good. but um, to, your, to your first point, um, Oh gosh. Um, so Audubon was being very scientific in nature, and so he, there was no sentimentality at all in what in, in what he was doing. Um, and I think Walter Anderson felt this too. I, sometimes I feel opportunistic. It's like, oh boy, it's a bird. You know, I can't go <laughs> away. And, and there's there's some part, some small part of me, and I shove it down. And and and. Um, um, because I'm, I'm more comfortable with it, honestly, than I, than I was before. But um, but that opportunistic thing it, it is always there. So you want to be as I want to be as reverent as I can with the, with these subjects, even the even the the, fly, the flowers and and the and the, the font the floral, excuse me. Um, uh, and 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 I feel y'all I feel real vulnerable with this work because it's really it hasn't been seen and 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 it's I mean it's another thank you to the museum. Most, most paintings are like children, and most of these things live on the studio floor, on um, stacked in corners, <laughs> and they're not framed. And so you know, getting a frame around them is like getting shoes on your children, mm -hmm. and putting them on a wall is like seeing them in their Sunday clothes. And so this is a real treat. And I was telling Julian earlier to see them in different light and see them on the walls makes me interact with them differently. And and I, and it's been a real uh, it's a real pleasure, but it's a real privilege to then see Anderson right next to it. So, yeah, merci. <laughs> Well, I think we'll, we'll end there. And Jason, of course, will be available for, for more conversation for those who are, who are with us in the room. And for those who are watching from beyond, uh, this exhibition is, is on view for several more months into February, I believe. So please do make a, an opportunist, an opportunity. Don't be an opportunist, but make, a, make a, an opportunity to, uh, to come down here and take advantage of that to, to see this wonderful work. And I'll just leave you with this idea of bearing witness. As Jason said, you know, to be a witness or to offer testimony these are words we think about in our everyday life, whether it's an ecclesiastical sense or a, a judicial sense to be a witness on, in a trial. Um, but, you know, not only is it vulnerable you know, to, to, for something to lay prone and dead, but it's, it's, it's a vulnerability to, to, to take that charge to be a witness. It's easy to walk past something. And so hopefully these artworks, just as all artists do, you know, they, they try to train our eyes to see how they saw the world. And anytime we can we can stretch and see things a little bit differently, whichever direction that may go, whatever part of the stream we're we're dipping into um, makes us uh, better people. So thank you all so much. Let's give a, a round of applause for Jason for joining us. <laughs>